welcome everyone to our Dhamma study. Today is Sunday, the 18th of February 2024, and this is our fourth lecture. I know there's a lot of um, things to be covered. I try to elaborate what mentioned in the curriculum uh, based on the framework of the elementary level of Dhamma study. But, uh, even though the program called elementary, it doesn't mean that what we learn here in this first level before you move to the intermediate and advanced. It doesn't mean that this level is the easiest. Okay, please don't look at the Dhamma that way. Okay, hope you still remember you know, the benefit of study Dhamma. At least five things that you will get benefit every time you listen to the Dhamma. Uh, you will hear something that you may never heard before. And I believe today is the same thing. You may hear something that you never heard before. Second, you even though you hear this subject before, you will understand differently. And the third one, you have clear and calm and happy mind when you listen to the Dhamma because we're talking about something peaceful, something beneficial. And also you will have a chance to clarify your doubt of the Dhamma that you may have before. And the last one is a chance for us to adjust the view, the right view toward life. Having the right view is, to me, is very crucial to understand the true nature of things, the true nature of life, what caused suffering to our life, what caused happiness to our life. Having the right view is the starting point of having a good life. Oppositely, if you have the wrong view, that's the starting point of destruction life. Whatever we understand, our thinking will follow. If our view toward meditation, that meditation is unbeneficial. Your thinking will be following the same direction. So I shouldn't practice meditation. Oh, sila, observing precept, make no benefit. If your view you know, toward that way, your thinking also will follow that, oh, I shouldn't be observing precept. So view is very important. The first thing on the list of the Eightfold Path, start from having the right view. You need to build the right view first. And how can you build the right view if you don't study Dhamma? So study Dhamma is, is the, the foundation, is the starting point to help adjust view. And then when you, your right view is being built and it's being sec secure, it's like a guarantee that you walk down the right path. And when it's come to study Dhamma, uh, keep in mind that Dhamma has three levels, right? You study the theory, you put into the practice, and you must realize it yourself. Ehipasiko, you must realize it yourself. And also, each Dhamma that we learn, each one of them also have layer. When we talk about precept, precept is not just, oh, I don't kill, don't lie. There, there are also a layer of precept. The first, you need to make an effort to observe precept. And that's the first step. You know, it's good, but it's hard for me. So I, I need to make an effort to observe precept. So this is the level of precept. That's good. While you make an effort, you start walk down the happy uh, the, the path of happiness. You will not do anything bad verbally and physically. And eventually it's become, you feel a little bit more comfortable of observing precept. When the mosquito bite you, at the beginning, you may want to kill it. And after a few months, you may feel like, okay, I'm just going to be patient and let it go. You don't, you don't even think of harming that little mosquito that, that, that bite you. And later on, you know, the highest level of precept, you and the precept become one. I am a man of precept. I will not break precept, no matter what situation in my life. So you see, there are layers of precept. You have to build, slowly build up. But first, how can you build it if you don't study what the concept of precept, what involved in the five precept, what involved in the eight precept, right? Get excited every time you have a chance to listen to the Dhamma. It's always beneficial. Before we continue for today's topic, uh, let's give ourselves a chance for a short meditation first.
Alright, you may take a good deep breath and softly open up your eyes. Alright, welcome everyone back. Okay. And today is the fourth lecture of the Dhamma subject. That means we have 11 weeks to go. Hope everyone still have an energetic mind yeah, to continue and to finish the, the class together. So today will be the last uh, uh, lecture that uh, we'll be talking or discussing about the Dhamma group number three. And next week we move on the Dhamma group number four, number five, number six, number seven, number eight, number nine, and number ten. We'll get to the number ten at the end of the 15 weeks. That's the idea of the elementary level. To me, when I bring up some subject, I want to show you where did this come from, how they related to what we learned in the previous lecture, and how can we put them into practice. So we may spend time on this topic more than that topic. It depends on you know my, my view toward this subject to you as a student. If anything you feel deep, too deep, don't understand, uh, you can go back and relearn. And I will have the reference at the end of the lecture so you can check more sutra if you like to go deeper, study on your own pace. That's how I see it. Okay? And before we go further, we will recap what we learned. So this is the fourth week, okay, the Dhamma group 3, part 3, on Sunday 18, February 2024. What we have been learning so far are these things. I hope you still remember of the Dhamma group 3, not group 2, okay? We learn Hiri Otapa, we learn Sati Sampachanya, we learn Kanti Soraja. That's the Dhamma group 2 on the first week. But when we move on the group 3, this is what we have been learning so far. We learn the concept of the triple gems, the Buddha gem, the Dhamma gem, the Sangha gem, why they're important, why they become the core pillar of Buddhist communities. So you need to know that. Uh, the quality, the, the virtue of the Buddha, the character of the Dhamma, Okay, and who is the Sangha, how many kind of Sangha. And then the instruction of the Buddha, which summarized into three things. This is summarized from the Ovatapati Mokha. The Buddha gave this instruction to 1,250 Arahan before they go back to wherever they're from to spread the Dhamma. Not to do all evil, to embrace or to do good, and to purify one's mind. For us, this is very simple translation very simple, summarized, and easy to grasp and easy to understand. But uh, we should know where this teaching comes from too. Before someone can come up with this simple instruction, to me, I, I, I really appreciate the teaching of the Buddha because this involves a lot of things. For example, the law of karma are hindered in here. It's hindered in here. Right? There's a law of karma which is related to the wholesome and unwholesome root. There's the karma, there's a defilement that cause us to do bad karma, and that bad karma will be kept in the mind and force us to do the bad action verbally, physically, and mentally. And with that, it will become the result, the vipaka, the result. So we reap what we sow. We do good, we get good. We do bad, we get bad. But the Buddha did not mention the law of karma here. It's going to be uh, time consuming to explain. It's going to be difficult for many new monks or the lay people to understand what is the law of karma. But if you do these three things, you most likely you'll be safe. Not to do bad, you find a way to do good, and pur purify one's mind. Purify one's mind is dealing with defilement in the mind, right? So not to do evil, to do good. There's a lot of things that behind this that you need to understand. But if we go quickly, we just memorize, oh, the Buddha teaches this thing. Don't do bad, do good meditation. That's how I have been taught, okay, as a young age. And I don't know where it's from. I don't know how this thing is so important. And sometimes I don't even know what is meant by the good and the bad that the Buddha wants me to know. And as we go deeper, we get to know that, oh, okay, there is um, the root cause of unwholesome, or we call the root three root of unwholesome, which is lopa or greed, dosa, hate, and the moha delusion, and also a avicca or ignorance. The guy behind the scene, the big boss, is behind this, which is did not mention here. They just by default there, but still, they like us. We should know that oh, there's the big boss behind this. There's an ignorance. There's a avicca, avicca from avicca stem from uh, to be greed, to be hate, and to be delusion. And whatever action that come from these three defilements we will end up suffering. 
no doubt about it. But if the action that come from opposite come from a l o p a a d o s a a m o h a non greed, non do, non hate, and non delusion, it will yield the happiness, not dukkha. This this is how we learn. This is how we analyze. This is how we think. We not just oh okay three things memorize it. Hopefully it will be appears in the exam and I will pass. So you need to kind of develop that kind of attitude when you learn the Dharma. And the Buddha also explained the good and the bad, which is this one. Actually, he mentioned this in the first teaching in the Dharma Chakka Pavatana, Pavatana Sutra. But most students we don't. We may not realize that it's already there. The Buddha talk about the karma, kaya karma. Because human being, we can take karma, we can do karma in three way, right? To the body, to the speech, and to the mind. Kaya karma, body action, w a j i karma, okay, the verbal action, and the mano karma, the mind action. Okay, uh, I will not test you in the Pali uh, uh, about Pali in the exam, but I need to mention this because when you study by yourself, when you study the Buddhist text. Is almost unavoidable to encounter the Pali terms, so it's good to start familiar with this term at the beginning level. Okay, but I will put the meaning in English, you know, so you know what it is. And if you hear often, uh, by default you will know what it is. Okay, kama, kaya is body, v a j i is speech, mano is the mind. Okay, it will it will be automatically memorized. So this is the bad, and this is the good. Taught by the Buddha, bodily action, killing, stealing, sexual misconduct is bad. But for us, killing is impossible. Why don't we say harming? Harming others is bad, right? As a monk, we're not allowed to kill. As a good Buddhist, we don't kill. But sometimes we harm, we harm others, physically, verbally, and mentally. So like this, if you see by literally by word, it means killing, right? Killing means taking life. Well, we not just go around and kill people or kill animal, but sometimes we have a tendency, we have agitated mind, okay, to to harm people, and that's something you can take the sila a bit further. Like I said, there are layer to it. So these two item, the body and speech, they they group into the sila or the precept. Sila cannot. Control the mind. The mind need to develop through the meditation or the loving kindness or the mindfulness practice. But the body and speech, we can use precept. If we observe five precept, these are the four precept already: killing, stealing, sexual misconduct. Right? These are false speech, slanderous speech, divisive speech. You know, and uh, uh, nonsense speech. These already, you know, we familiar with this. These are the five precept. Just one thing missing here is which is intoxicant, right? Consume intoxicant that crowded your mind, and for the my part, okay, covetousness that come from greed, the ill will or payabat, you know, come from hate, and the wrong will. The reason we have wrong will is because of delusion. Delusion, you think of the darkness. We don't see things the way they are. We don't see things clearly. That's why we make wrong decision. You see, sila samadhi panya already here. Okay, the sila. Development, the my development, and the panya of wisdom development—they already here. So this is the summary of the eight four path in different form. I don't know whether you can see it the way I see it. This is you know how we link the dharma that we learn together. We cannot we cannot get out of the framework of the eight four path, whatever the dharma that we learn, because every single dharma that we learn it will lead us to the the liberation of the mind, the freedom of mind from suffering. And oppositely, this consider the the good, right? If you don't kill, you don't steal, no sexual misconduct. You speak correctly, and you have no greed, no ill will. You have the right view. This consider the good, right? And and also, but also there are detail to this. But at least you see what the Buddha means by doing good, not doing bad, and purify the minds. This is what we have been discussing, and we also talking about this. The way of making merit, we talk about the concept of merit of punya, okay, and we talking about the concept of demerit, or papa, or bab in Thai. <coughs> the punya and the papa, you need to know what it is. Okay, it's not just merit, not just doing good, not just pick up the garbage, not just sweep the floor. Merit, 
to the land of Buddhism has a deep meaning. When, when Buddhist people hear the word merit, they feel joy, they feel rapture, they feel elation, they feel blissful. That's the merit, that's the energy, the positive energy that happens every time we think good, do good, and say good. And in short, from 10 ways of making merit, coming down to three ways, which is this one. You give, you observe precept, and you purify the mind. And you need to un understand these two things go together. How can you, what is the antidote for greed? What is the antidote for dosa or hate? What is the antidote for moha or delusion? The answer is here. Right? That's why the Buddha said, if you remember nothing, you just continue to give, continue to observe precept, and continue to purify your mind through meditation. And he did not explain much. But in fact, what you are doing according to, if you follow, follow his teaching, you actually work on this guy. You lessen or slowly uh, remove the power of lopa, dosa, and moha from your mind until one day you, know, you will be able to remove them completely. And when that happens, you will realize the ultimate happiness, which is Nibbana, right? But for now, we don't even know what Nibbana is. If we take the teaching of the Buddha seriously, we just, he, he, he make the Dhamma practice simple, just following this pattern, uh, this framework, just to give, to observe preserve, and to purify your mind through meditation and mindfulness practice. And today we will continue with this. Number one, we will talk about the un unfailing practice or apanaka. Apanaka means it's a sure course, it's a sure practice that if you follow this, following this practice, it's a sure way that lead you to Nibbana, to be happy. And the second, we'll be talking about the, um, the Trilakana. Again, Trilakana is a Pali term, Apanaka is a Pali term. Trilakana means the three common or universal characteristic of things, of conditioned things. So this may be new to some of us here, but it's okay, we're here to learn. Even though you learned it before, today, to see if you will get something new out of this topic that you think that you know. This is what the Dhamma Group 3 that we'll be covering in our series of lecture. So I will not continue for the Dhamma Group 3. Uh, we will finish today and next week we start the Dhamma Group 4. So, so far if you have any question, okay, you can write it down, you can type into the chat box. Okay, at the end I will, you know, hopefully we have time to answer that question. With that being said, we will start the lecture today of the new topic. I sent you the file already. You can keep that, uh, save it somewhere as your reference in case you cannot make note of all of this uh, that appears on the screen. For the Dhamma Group 3, Part 3, today we'll be learning the Trilakana. Tri, tri mean 3. The common is a universal, common or universal characteristic. Lakana mean characteristic of things. Usually you hear the word things, but uh, to be specific, it should be said the condition things is not just the thing. And the uh, second one we'll be talking about the apanakatam, the sure course, the sure practice for us to be happy. Start from number one, the trilakana first. Uh, the teaching of the Buddha, if you uh, pay close attention, you may realize that the Buddha did not create or invent anything. What he teach us is something, is, is the thing that he discovered. It's already there. It's the law of nature. He mentioned whether I exist or not. This thing already here. This thing point to what? Point to the law of nature. They're already here, but we just don't know that. We born, we get ill, we get old, we die. This is the nature of thing. You think of the fire. The nature of the fire is hot, right? If you touch it, if you burn your hand, the character of the water is cold, is cohesive. That's the nature of the water, whether the water in Thailand, the water in the US, the water in China, the same character. That's why it's called universal law of nature, universal law of the nature of things. The Trilakana is similar to this. We learn the law of gravity, right? When we, when we take scientific class, the science class that discovered by Isaac Newton, everyone noticed that the, the, the fluid 
is falling off the tree. Mangoes, apple, you name it. When the time is right, when the condition is right, that fruit will fall. And who make it fall? Nobody. When the condition is right, it will fall. It's the law of nature. When the condition is right, we will born. Human will born. When the condition is right, that human will die. Who make us die? Nobody, right? It's the, it's the condition of thing. It's the law of nature. It has to be like that. Nobody lasts forever. This is a painful truth. Isaac Newton discovered that, hey, there's there's why, you know, apple fall down the tree and hit my head. Because his mind was so focused. This called meditation. When you in deep meditation, sometimes you get to the wisdom. The intuitive wisdom. You understand something that you never understand before. It happened to me many times. Sometimes in the morning, after a nice meditation, all of a sudden the good idea come up. And I, this is something that I have been figured out in the past week. I didn't know how to understand this. I didn't know how this works. And all of a sudden, I know the moment that I come out of that meditation. So his mind was occupied by, you know, he tried to figure out something. And he got the answer why this apple hit his head. And he come up with the law of gravity. The object will fall, right? It depends on the size, depends on the space between the ground, you know, and the, uh, the roof or the height of that, uh, the, the, the distance where the object will fall. There's energy involved, but it will fall. Whether uh, you throw this apple off the roof in New York, in Bangkok, or in Singapore, same thing happened. It's the law of nature. It's nothing magical, but how many people actually have that sharp sense of observation? Why nature act like that? Why nature behave like that? The Prince Siddhartha have the same character. He observed that why people get old, why people get ill, why people die. Where did we come from? What am I doing here? Where am I going after I die? He start asking questions to himself. All kind of questions that seem to be mundane questions for all of us. We don't, we don't even think. We born, we all, we die. That's what happened to our ancestors and it will happen to us too. And we don't think beyond that. Is there any cure for that? Any solution for that? This is how smart people think. It's the law of nature. So the Trilakana, same thing. It's the law of nature that the Buddha discovered. He mentioned himself clearly. Almost 3,000 years ago, he said, whether the Buddha arise in this world or not, the persist, that law, that Dhamma, that stable principle of the Dhamma, that fixed, that fixed mean what? It's unchangeable of Dhamma. Technical term is called Dhamma Niyama. This is another deep topic. If you like, check it out. It's not easy topic. It's good to know. This is how the Buddha discovered the law of karma. So he said whether he arise or not, they exist. In this case, in this particular sutra, Apana Sutra, he points specifically to this law. What law? He said the Buddha awake to this, to this what? To this law of nature. And realize it that all conditioned things are anicca. Okay, maybe a new term for some of us. Anicca, I will explain in a moment. Okay, for now, anicca is impermanent. All conditioned things are dukkha or suffering. But it's not just a regular suffering that we understand. All things are anatta or not self. That's even more difficult to understand, to grasp the idea of non self. But this is what the Buddha discovered. I realized it. And then he said, a realized one, that's another name for the Buddha, the Tathagata, the awakened one, the teacher, the realized one, point to the Buddha. The Buddha understand this, this, this refer to what? This refer to this law of nature, this Dhamma. And he comprehend it. Then he explain, he teach, he asserts, he establishes, he clarifies, he analyzes, and he revealed it. That's what he did. He did not create. He did not invent. He discovered and he shared with us, hey guy, this thing happened. This thing exists. You may think of some other law that the Buddha discovered, like the law of karma. He did not create it. You do good, you get good. You do bad, you get bad. It's nothing magical. Uh, think of the law of uh, causalities. 
the itapajayata, itapatijat samupabada, the dependent origination. These are the law of cause and effect. You do this, you get this. If you do something that drive by unwholesome root, greed, hatred, delusion, definitely you will end up suffering. And the reason you end up suffering because your action drive by the negative energy. And if you do something oppositely that drive by non lopa, non dosa, non moha, you will be, you know, for sure your life will be happy and happier. It become wholesome result because drive is drive by that action drive by a wholesome root. Something like this. The Buddha just try to explain to us that these things exist. Be careful. Be careful. For us, we don't even know they exist, right? We, we, we have no idea what it is. What is impermanent? What is suffering? What is not self? Something that's new to many Dhamma students. And this is, you may hear it often. When you go to the funeral in Thailand, you hear the monk chants, the Abhidhamma, about the uh, Sankhara. Saphe Sankhara Anicca. Saphe Sankhara Anicca. That means all sankhara are impermanent or conditioned thing. This one. Saphe sankhara dukkha or conditioned thing or sankhara are unsatisfactory. Saphe tamma anatta or dhamma are not self. So we have no idea what it is. What is sankhara? What is dukkha? What is anatta? What is non self? But, uh, but for today, I will keep it simple. Okay? I will point you to, you to some other sutra if you want to study by yourself as well. But I will not go deep because it's going to be another huge topic, topic and it needs more time to explain. So, Sapphe Sankhara Anicca, Sapphe Sankhara Thukha, Sapphe Dhamma Anatta. Buddhist people will be familiar with this. When we go to funeral, we hear it often. Sankhara, Sankhara means condition thing. Okay? Condition thing <coughs> are impermanent. Condition thing are dukkha. I, I usually I don't translate the word dukkha because dukkha usually translate to suffering, unsatisfactoriness, which is again is not enough. Okay, it's not enough. Uh, it doesn't give us enough meaning, a full meaning of the word dukkha, or in in all dimension, and so pe dhamma anatta or dhamma are not self. These things are. Uh, sometimes people come up to me with uh, all kind of question. For here, just for the food for thought, which I I may or may not give you the answer. My question to you is: Why in this teaching, the Buddha said "sapphe sankhara anicca, sapphe sankhara dukkha," and all the sudden he said "sapphe dhamma anatta." Why didn't he said "sapphe sankhara anatta"? Why didn't he used the same word, which is Sankhara, it's, it's go to, it will be coherent, right? At the end, he said, Sapphe Dhamma Anatta. And that's still a lot of Buddhist scholars, and many of them still debate what is mean by Dhamma, Sapphe Dhamma Anatta, or Dhamma is not say what does it mean? See, this is when you study, you need to develop this kind of mind, the detective mind. Detective mind. Why? Why didn't he use the same word? If he used the same word, that make a lot of sense. It clarify a lot of things. Sapphe dam, sapphe sankhara anatta. To me, it make a lot of sense. But when change to the word sapphe dhamma anatta, that sometimes create confusing. What it mean? What exactly by the dhamma? Does dhamma mean everything? Is everything anatta? Is everything non-self? Okay, this is this is another uh, debatable topic. I I came across one of the book uh, written by the German philosophy. I have it somewhere here. He said the doctrine of the Buddha. And this professor tried to explain what it means by non-self through his view. Is there anything else that the Buddha did not explain behind this? It's the thick one, almost 500 pages. Okay, it's not easy to read, but it's, you know, in case you are interested, okay, don't stop yourself here. So in short, the Thairakana, Thrai, again, mean three, right? <clears throat> Thairakana, from the Pali text, they use the word samma. Oh, I'm sorry. Samanya lakana. Okay. Saman mean common. Lakana mean characteristic. The common or the universal characteristic of all things, all conditioned things. There are three things. 
That's why they put the word "try" in front. Try mean three, three universal characteristic of all condition thing. When you hear the word condition, what do you think of? Condition mean it cannot exist by itself. It has to be condition like this body, this five aggregate. They consider condition thing. The body and the mind also have to stay together in order in order for human being to stay alive. And the body itself also conditioned by what? By the four elements: earth, water, wind, and fire. If we don't have these four elements, the body cannot become the body. But because we have these four elements, then the body can become the body according to the law of nature. And with this body and the mind, then we become human being. So these five aggregate is a perfect example for what it means by condition thing. If you cannot think of anything else, you can stick with this. Condition thing refer to the body and the mind, right? But keep in mind that the law of nature, this law of nature, the trilakana, is govern all of the living thing and non-living thing. The trees, the buildings, also fall into this law, right? It's impermanent. Number one, I will explain a little bit in a moment. Dukkha, okay. This is second character of the condition thing. It will be impermanent. It will be dukkha. It will be Anatta or not self or uncontrollable. Okay, start from number one. Anicca, impermanent. Anicca, the definition of anicca is mean is rise and fall, moment to moment, moment to moment. It's anicca, it keep on changing. So English vocabulary, uh, common vocabulary that they use, they call impermanent. But when you hear the word impermanent, I want you to understand deeper that. Whatever impermanent, that means that thing keep changing moment to moment. Even one second, it cannot stay like that. Human body, according to the scientific discover, 300 million cells die every minute. The moment that we breathe in and breathe out, 300 hundred million cells die every single minute. So that means our nail, our teeth, our hair today is not the same as yesterday. But we don't see the changes because it's just yesterday and today. But if you look at your picture 10 years ago, you notice that a lot of change happening. Your hair turned gray, have more wrinkle. Your face doesn't look bright as before when you were young. They are hidden in there, but they they keep on happening without a clear notification. We don't know it right away, but we have to wait. But we know that it's happening. It's instability. Of inconstancy, the condition of arising, uh, deteriorating, and disintegrating, moment to moment. That's anicca, and this applies to non-living being too. Is anicca? The thing of the tree, the buildings, they all changing moment to moments. I will connect the dot for you in a moment. Let's go to the second one. The second term called dukkha. The second characteristic of the condition thing called dukkha. Dukkha usually translate to suffering, but in this case, in this law of nature, okay, dukkha doesn't mean headache, stomach ache, body pain. No, but it means something that's unsustainable. You think of this electron and proton that keep spinning very quickly. If anything that moving very fast, that means there's unhappiness there. They cannot remain calm. This is being oppressed. Something is gonna break apart sooner or later. It's being oppressed. That's the idea of dukkha. The building is being oppressed. Thousand years from now, this building will not be here. It will be gone. It will be collapsed. Right? Hundred years from now, none of us will be here. We're going somewhere. Hundred years ago, we did not exist. Now we come to exist. Where do we go after we die? We have no idea. But this law of nature, the Buddha discovered. Hey. You guys, please don't be careless. You may still think that you are young. You have a long way to go in your life. That's the careless thinking because your life is governed by this law of nature. Every moment, every breath that you take, your body is deteriorating. It change moment to moment, and it's also being oppressed. Okay, the condition of oppression, preventing it from remaining as it is, the internal imperfection of thing. This is the internal. The intrinsic, um, <clears throat> the intrinsic nature of things, of life, of the nature around us, 
is become like this. It cannot stay like this forever. And the last, uh, uh, before we go to the last one, uh, this is something I think is important to mention here because when we study the Four Noble Truth, you will come across the word Dukkha again. The Four Noble Truth, the First Noble Truth, talk about Dukkha. But here in the in the Trilakana or the uh, the common characteristic of nature that the Buddha discovered, he also mentioned the word Dukkha. Are they the same or are they not the same? The Dukkha in the Four Noble Truth focus on living being, on human. But the Dukkha in the Trilakana, the, this law of nature, okay, is governed both being and non-being. Okay, being and non-being. It collapsed. The buildings you made by you know, cement or concrete that seem to be very strong, seem to last very long, but it doesn't matter how long it lasts, is we know for sure that it's going to collapse, it's going to fall apart. That's the idea of dukkha, okay? Not just headache, stomach ache, or physical pain. It's being oppressed. I think inside the body, every single cell is being oppressed at the moment. That's why 300 million cells die every one, every one minute. It needs to change. It needs to break apart because all of the cells in the body, they are being oppressed. by. They stay by condition. When the condition is right, they have to replenish themselves. They have to die, they have to reborn, and it's ongoing moment to moment until the day we die, non-stop. And uh, another word is called anatta. Another characteristic of conditioned thing is called anatta. This is another confusing word. But today we're going to keep it simple. Okay? The non-self, sometimes you hear the word not self. What does it mean by non-self? I'm here, but you said I'm not here. The condition of things being void, of a real abiding self. That's the definition. Still, it's hard to grasp the idea. What, what it means by being void, no permanent identity in us, in this body and in this mind. Now we come to something that's quite uh, deep, Dhamma principle to grasp. If you don't meditate, if you just read, no matter how much time you spend on reading, no matter how many books you read, you will not understand what it means by anatta. I'm here. I'm sitting here reading this book. And the book said, you are not here. There's no you. So it makes no sense. And there's a reason for that. We are considered an ignorant being. Ignorant being, this is how ignorant people see things. They cling on. They see impermanent things as permanent. They see suffering as happiness. They see not self as self. They see something not beautiful as beautiful. This is how we see the world. That's what the Buddha teach 2,500 years ago. But for the monk who have developed the mind through the meditation practice to the advanced level, they start understand this. They start grasping this idea that, hey, I have been clinging to this body and mind wrongly for my whole life. If you think of the first teaching, the Dhammacakapavatana Sutta, the discourses on the roaring view of the Dhamma that the Buddha gave the teaching for the first time to the five monks. And one monk understand at the end of that teaching, the Kontanya, the monk named Kontanya, he understood. With that understanding, he changed his view, the way he see himself, the way he see the nature around him. He achieved the first level of enlightenment, become the stream entry. So he can let go a certain level of clinging to his body and mind. But the rest, the four monks, they still did not get it, what the Buddha mean by this. And then later on, the Buddha gave the second teaching, which is uh, called Anattalakana Sutra, this one. And then after these five monks listened to this teaching, all of them achieved the arahanship. Their mind were liberated. They become arahan. No more defilement left in the mind. So the idea of self and non-self is quite uh, seriously uh, misunderstanding back then. And this is what the Buddha said. What do you think about this monk? Is the body permanent or impermanent? And the monk answered, impermanent, sir. But is that which is impermanent painful or pleasurable? Painful, sir. But is it fit to consider that which is impermanent, painful, of a nature, uh, of a nature to change? As this is mine, this is 
am I and this is myself? And the monk answered, no, sir, it is not. For us, we may read this many times, but we still don't get it. But for those five monks who happen to be the advanced meditator, they understand right away what the Buddha means. With that understanding, or we can call with that right view that the Buddha helped them to develop, they are liberated. The mind let go of all the clinking, that there is no such thing called permanent self in me. So the mind just being liberated from that wrong clinking. The reason I mention this because is we are talking about the idea of non-self, and there are places in the Buddhist text that the Buddha talk about the concept of non-self, especially this second teaching that he explained in detail what he means by non-self or anatta. That's why it's called anatta. Anatta, lakana. Lakana means characteristic. Characteristic of the idea of anatta. Anatta means non-self. Atta means self. That's the teaching that uh, Lung Pi brought it up so you can uh, perhaps uh, study later on. And this is us, right? We see things oppositely to the way the Arahant beings see things. We see impermanent in something that... Uh, <laughs> do you see? We see permanent in something that impermanent. We see happiness in something that's suffering. We see self in something that's not self. We see something beautiful from something that's not beautiful at all. When we look at this body, we feel like, oh, you are handsome, you're so beautiful. That's how we see it. But there are many cases uh, explained in the Buddhist text that many monks in the past, they said this, the body is ugly, it's loathsomeness, it's the cause of disease. There's nothing beautiful in this body. All kind of disease. If you, if you can look through the skin, this is what you see. You see the bone, see the flesh, you see the blood, you see saliva. It's nothing beautiful. But for us, we still cling on the beauty of the body. Male or female, that's how we see it. Our mind is still crowded by lust, by delusion, and by ignorance. And this is example of the idea of the way the Arahan, the, the pick, there is the female Arahan named Wachira, Wachira Bhikkhuni. She achieved Arahanship following the teaching of the Buddha. And this is how she see life. She see the body and mind. She see the five aggregates. And the idea of the word anatta or non-self. She said, just as with an assembly of the part, just as the word chariot is used, chariot, I don't have the picture of chariot, so I use the picture of the car. So when the aggregate exists, there is the convention a being. So we need to give this a name. We need to call it something. So we call a car, we call a man, we call a woman. It is only dukkha, but for her, it is only dukkha that comes to be. It is only dukkha that stands and falls away. Nothing but dukkha comes to be, nothing but dukkha ceases. And this is quite deep. This is from seeing, not from intellectually trying to understand what it means by five aggregate, what it means by non-self. She actually sees it. And that is why uh, when it comes to uh, the idea of five aggregate through the lens of Sariputta, through the lens of you know, those Arahant people, male and female monks back then, they see that these five aggregates is emptiness, is void, is disease, is loathsome, is nonsense. It's there be because of the condition. So what it mean by anatta then? And the Buddha give us some uh, criteria to look at how can we consider this is self or this is non self? He just explained very simple. He said, Body is not self. Now, were this body self? If the body is self, this body would not, would not tend to sickness. And one might get the chance of saying, Regard to the body. So, you basically you can say this Oh, let the body become dust for me, let the body become this for me. In other words, you can tell yourself not to get old, not to get ill, not to die, to remain young, to remain beautiful, to remain handsome forever. If you can do that, that means you can call it self. But if you cannot call this 
to whatever that you feel like is belong to you or the idea of not self right if you cannot do this then you need to accept that these things are considered non self so in this case from this particular teaching to keep it simple the idea of anatta mean that you cannot control is uncontrollable can you control your body to be the way that you want your body to be can you control your car to be like this forever can you control your wife your dogs your kids anything can you name just one thing that you have fully you have full control over it 100% you can challenge the teaching of the buddha that old oh, buddha i have one i have over i have control over this 100% you think about it if you can control then you can consider self if you cannot control and then that thing should be considered non self or not self and for a bhikkhu bhikkhu mean monks right all the khanda aggregate this body and mind are insubstantial they are not subject to one's control this teaching found in another place in the tipitaka but is relevant to what we are talking about today that's the concept of anatta why is called being void right in this particular translator he used the word insubstantial they are not subject to control you cannot control uncontrollable if anything you cannot control then it's not self and by understanding this one will be liberated all conditioned thing are impermanent anicca all conditioned thing are suffering dukkha or conditioned thing or phenomena or dhamma are non self when one see this by wisdom if you see then one is wary of suffering you will be detached from suffering from dukkha this is the path to the purity see refer to eyes when you have eye you can see when you see you understand wisdom refer to understand understand the truth the truth the law of nature that in this case definitely is not the seeing from the physical eyes chakku karani lead to yana karani chakku mean eye yana mean wisdom when you develop chakku then you access to that wisdom if you don't have eye you cannot see and how can you get that eye he did not teach you here he teach you some place else but if you see thing the way they are see what see thing the way they are see condition thing as impermanent keep changing moment to moment see condition thing as suffering is unsustainable and see things as non self or anatta that mean you cannot control you have no control over it if you think the way they are like this you will be liberated from suffering and the reason we still suffer we still here because we don't see things the way they are that's what it means so you need to keep on practicing the dhamma so one day you start seeing things the way they are and the benefit of learning this if you try to put what we learned today into practice the idea of uh, the characteristic universal characteristic of all conditioned things people we love even ourselves the car the house the buildings they subject to change and nothing much we can do about it we can prolong we can delay the changing process by maintaining car keep you know changing oil according to the schedule keep eat good food exercise we can live a little bit longer that car can use a little bit longer but we cannot stop this law of nature from happening it will change it will collapse we will be die the car will be broken one day so by understanding this it help us to not to be careless it help us to let go help us to forgive whether the people we love the people we hate we subject to the same law of nature it develop sympathy loving kindness If someone hurt your feeling you find way to let go because at the end of the day whether someone you love or someone you hate we will have to go to bed and when we go to bed we don't know whether we will wake up tomorrow or not because we subject to this law of nature It help us to this passionness this passionness and less clinging on the thing too much by developing this put in this practice into practice you will have a happier life you start to apply the law of nature into the realities all right that's uh, something 
that Lung Pi plan to share with you about the idea of the three common characteristics of all things. If any questions, feel free to make a note or type in the chat box. We'll move on to the second topic, the unfailing practice. Unfailing. Unfailing practice or apanaka tam. Apanaka means a sure cause, a sure practice. If you practice these three things, you are surely on your way to be happy. But today I'll, I will take you deep, deeper than just what is mentioned in the books. And you may have no idea where this thing comes from. If you study only the book that you receive, the file that you downloaded from our website, they will not mention something like this. And it's difficult to connect the dot. But today I will review the whole process and where these three things fit into the complete process for us to be happy, for us to realize Nibbana. This is something what the Buddha teach the monk. He did not teach the lay people according to this teaching. But in this uh, Apanaka Tham, this is what the Buddha teach the lay people. You practice this, you'll be happy. But he omit okay, the full version of the process of how a man can become fully liberated from suffering. Let's see uh, the detail of this particular Dhamma. Unfailing practice. You study Dhamma, you keep in mind whether you are lay people or a monk, the Buddha point to the ultimate destination of life called Nibbana, a supreme happiness, unchangeable happiness, a sustainable happiness, somewhere over there down the road. But it cannot happen overnight. You need to develop yourself. You need to intensively, day and night, train yourself under the framework of what? We learn the sila, right? We learn the mind, and we learn the wisdom. We, you need to develop yourself according to this framework. They call the three-four training. Training, develop the body and the speech, develop the mind, and develop the panya or the wisdom. It's a short version of the eightfold path. This is the eightfold path, the path to the happiness. As a monk, you can walk faster. You don't have to work. You don't have to take care of your kid, your business. But as a lay person, we still walk down the same path, but it may take longer. You need to uh, be more patient. You need to have, uh, uh, make more effort to get there because you have too much worry in your lay life, right? That is why people back then, when they listened to the teaching of the Buddha, they have faith toward the teaching. They decided to leave everything behind and become among all the aesthetics to realize Nibbana at no time, as quickly as possible. So this is the ultimate goal of the holy life, whether you are a Buddhist monk or a lay people. You may or may not aware of it when you become a monk. This is what this is your main job to study Dhamma and put the Dhamma into practice and to be specific what it means by practice the Dhamma. To do this, to remove lust, to remove hate and to remove delusion from your mind. If you can do that, then you realize Nibbana. And how can you do that? In short, you need to observe precept. You need to practice meditation, develop the mind. And you need to develop the ultimate wisdom, right? The pavana, maya panya, the wisdom that come from understanding things the way they are, not just thing that I understand. You need to see. You need to realize that kind of wisdom that I mentioned. And today, Pajan Varud mentioned that um, beside wisdom, right? The Buddha praised the patient. Patient also hidden here in this apanaka tam. Okay, we'll take a look in a moment. This is. The final destination, the final goal of the holy life, whether you are in short term or you are in long term. And this can apply to all Buddhists as well. So the unfailing practice, there are three things. Number one is called the control of the sense. Number two is called the moderation in eating. And number three is called practice of wakefulness. And this is the sutra. It's called Apanaka Sutra from Ankutara Nikai. You can check it out from this reference. The Buddha said, monks, when a monk has three things, sometimes the same teaching, he teach the lay people. Sometimes he teach the monk, but use the same Dhamma topic. But he may give different examples, different detail, explanation of that particular Dhamma. In, this, in Apanaka Sutta, the Buddha talked to the monk and he said, When a monk has three things, his practice is unfailing. And he has laid, he has laid the groundwork for ending the defilements. What are the defilements? Greed, hatred, delusion. And what are the three? 
the Buddha said, it went among guard the sense doors, or in triya samvara, in si sangwon, in triya samvara. When the monk eats in moderation, moderation in eating of bojana matanyuta, bojane matanyuta. And when the monk is dedicated to wakefulness or chakriya nuyoko, chakriya nuyoko, in Thai we call chakriya nuyoko. Let's give you the Pali terms in case you want to uh, familiar with it. Number one, guard the sense door. Number two, eat in moderation. And number three, practice of wakefulness. These three things consider an unfailing practice to have a sustainable happiness or apanaka dhamma. I can stop here and you can pass the exam. That's what it means if you study the uh, Naktam tree by yourself. But you will learn nothing much. You will learn nothing much. How can you apply sati and sampachanya? How can you apply khanti and perseverance in here? That's how you need to think further. What it means by guard the center? Why guarding the center make me happy? Why eat in moderation help me to attain nibbana quicker? Why dedicated to wakefulness allow me to develop my mind better? What involved for me to be success in meditation practice? You need to ask, keep on asking yourself, right? And here, this picture may be helpful. Number one, the Buddha talk about indriya samvara, samvara, control of the sense door. Why control of the sense door is important? Why is considered an unfailing practice to be happy? We learn sati, we learn sampachanya. Today, you can put into practice when you hear the word control the sense door. We contact to the world outside, the outside world, through the sense, right? We have eye to see, we have ear to hear, we have uh, nose to smell, we have tongue to taste, we have body to touch. And when we have contact to the world, this is called contact. When you have good eye, the eye see object. And when the eye see object and you are conscious, your consciousness, your eye consciousness arise, we call Jakku Vinyana. When your eye consciousness arises and there is an object and your eye is good, you're not blind, feeling follow. When your ear consciousness, when you have sounds come to your, sorry, okay. When you have sound come to your ear and you have ear consciousness, sota vinyana, jakku means seeing, sota means hearing. When you have that, you can understand what that sounds. It's the sound of the bird, the sound of the dog, Sound of someone say something bad, sound of someone say something good, then feeling. When you feel, you think. If you don't guard your sense door, you give a, a chance for the defilement to take control of your mind. You can either think good, think bad, or not good, not bad, right? And when you are mindful here at this, in this process, if you are mindful of the thing that you see, of the thinking, that's the feeling that's, that starts happening, feel good, feel like, feel don't like, then you can stop the elaboration process. There are two steps of thinking. The first step is when you perceive, you know this, this is the car, this is the flower, this is my mom, this is my dad. You think, you know what you see. You think, oh, this is my dad. This is the car. This is BMW. There's nothing wrong with the first level of thinking, but usually there's always a problem at the second layer of thinking when start when you start to elaborate based on the craving in your mind. Oh, that's BMW. Oh, that's the new iPhone. I want it. When there is the feeling of I want it, then this is the starting point of suffering. You will do your best, whether you have money or not, to buy the car, to buy the phone. But if you are mindful in, at this stage, you have sati. Remember, sati first, then sampachanya or the clear comprehension can start function. This second element, they support each other. We learn on the at the first week, the sati and sampachanya, the clear comprehension. When sampachanya start function, most likely you make a better decision, not based on the defilements, but based on the right understanding, based on the wisdom. Should I buy it? Should I not buy it? Should I say something bad to him? Should I remain quiet? So if you control your sendal, this is good. You cannot fail when you develop the skill of guarding your sense door. So the craving come from here, come from what you see, what you smell, what you hear, what you taste, what you touch, based on the teaching of the Buddha. 
Craving doesn't come from the sky. It comes from here. And it goes through these five aggregates. If you guard them well, then you can slow or minimize the process of uh, mental formation to elaborate what you see, what you hear. So it doesn't give, give rise to craving to your mind when you start you know, seeing things, something you like or something you don't like. Number two is called moderation in eating of Poshane Matan Yutta. It sounds simple. To me, this one is one of the most things to practice as a monk because sometimes I realize that the moment that we lose conscious, we're not mindful the most, is the moment that we eat. Every time we eat, we talk. We don't eat quietly. The monk back then, they, they don't talk. They eat when they eat, they don't talk. But when we eat, we talk. So you do two things at the same time. And when you eat, your mind with the food that you like. And you reject the food that you don't like. Even though you're not supposed to do that as a monk. So Pochane Matanyata is not like, it's not just eating good food. It's not just eating delicious food, tasty food. It's more than that. It's how can you minimize greed in your mind when you eat each spoonful of food that's in your mouth. When you eat something you like, you feel like, I want more of this. You start chewing fast, swallow fast, and take the second bite, the third bite. And you neglect the food that you don't like. I'm going to go back to this. When you eat steak, you want to go back to french fry, go back to Coca-Cola. And when I finish Coca-Cola, I will go for the ice cream. While you have the steak in your mouth, you might thinking of ice cream already as a dessert. So you're not mindful of eating. And that is why you are what you eat. You are what you eat. And Buddhist monk, this is what we chant when we eat. This is what the Buddha teach. This is how the Buddha train us. Wisely, this is Panya. A monk who have Panya or wisdom will think like this. I use this food not for fun, not for pleasure, not for flattening, making more muscle or beautify myself, you know, but for only for the new nourishment and maintenance of this body for keeping it healthy, for helping with the holy life. Thinking like this, I shall destroy the old feeling. Old feeling refer to the hungry, right? We feel hungry every day. That's why we eat. So you prevent the suffering that comes from being hungry and not produce the new suffering by overeating. You need to have the right amount of food. And thus, there will be freedom from physical discomfort and living at ease. This is the purpose of us eating food each day, breakfast and lunch. Some monk eat one meal a day, some monk eat two meals a day, some monk eat a lot of refreshment at the, in the, or the pana in the evening, some monk, they don't eat anything. Why do you eat chocolate? Why do you eat ice cream? Do you have to eat it? What the reason behind that eating? So you need to reflect on this. That's why I said this one is difficult. It's considered difficult. Don't take it lightly. And, and also there's a suggestion. When do you know how, when do you know that I should stop eating? This is the beauty of the teaching of the Buddha. When eating fresh or dry food, one should be, one should, should, should not be over repleted. A monk should wander mindfully with empty stomachs. See, monk usually Ideally, monks should eat less. Eat less, it doesn't mean you have to torture yourself being hungry in the evening. Okay? You make sure that you know how much that the body needs food and water each day. Taking limited food, four and five mouthful before you are full, then you drink. That's enough. If you feel like, if you, if you take four or five more spoonful of rice, then you will be full then stop. That means you're already full. But the water is still on its way to your stomach. If you stop right then and you take water, then you'll be perfect. Perfectly full. There's enough food in your stomach already. And then you will live in comfort. Next time you eat, why don't you really reflect what you just shared, what you just said? And can you stop eating when you feel like four or five more spoonful, I will be full. I think this benefit for both monk and the lay people. We don't even know when to stop. We will stop when we cannot take it no more. Then we stop, right? Because the food is so delicious, especially when someone pay for it. You don't pay for it. Just take as much as you can. So 
as a Dharma student, we practice according to the Buddha teaching. Let's see if next time you, when you eat, you is you can remind yourself, hey, I just learned this topic. Why don't I put into practice? If it's not important, the Buddha will not list it there to train the monk to achieve or realize nibbana. They always list it there, whether the short teaching or the long teaching, for the monk to moderate in eating. If the monk cannot understand and cannot practice moderation in eating, that monk cannot realize nibbana. Why he put it there? And the last one, practice of wakefulness. Here, Sariputta. When Abhikkhu Sariputta is one of the uh, Buddha great disciple who happened to be the master in wisdom, when Abhikkhu has returned from his arms round, the monk we go out to the village in the morning and people give us food. That's called arms round, and we eat whatever we receive. After his meal, he sit down, he fold his legs crosswise or cross legged, set his body erect and establishing mindfulness in front of him. And he said, I shall not break this sitting position until uh, I shall not break this sitting position until through not clinking my mind is liberated from the tense. The tense means the tanha or the defilements. Wakefulness is opposite to laziness. If you are lazy, whether you monk or a lay person, you cannot go nowhere in life. There is no success overnight if you don't work hard on it. Same thing in meditation practice. There are many monks back then who train themselves day and night because when someone ordained, that person aim to achieve Nibbana quickly. That's why they leave everything behind. Just like Venerable Chakupala or the blind monks. He made a vow when he entered the rainy season to he will not lie down. He either walk, sit and stand. He practiced meditation like that until you know, his, his eyes went blind. But he will, will not stop. Just keep on doing that. And he achieved Arahan in that three months. This may sound extreme, but it tells us something. We can learn something from this. We don't have to do this, but we should learn something from this. That laziness takes us nowhere in life. Only people who, you know, when, you do some, when they do something, they do it for real. If you just want to test it out, again, your experience will not same as the person who do it for real. If you feel like meditation is, is real, is benefit, it can help me to reduce stress. It can help me to realize Nibbana. It can help me to be calm, relax more. Then you put your practice. You have discipline. You go forward. No matter how early you have to wake up. No matter how difficult of the situation. It's too hot today. Uh, no electric today. No air conditioning. Oh, I'll meditate tomorrow. This and that. You start uh, give yourself uh, an option to be lazy, which is not good. And this is what I found that relevant to this teaching that we learned. You will not find this if you just stick with the elementary level. Okay, we learn guard the sense door. We learn moderation in eating. We learn intent to wakefulness. But in another teaching, the Buddha said, if you practice these four things, you close to Nibbana. You are close to Nibbana. In this particular sutra, Aparihaniya Sutra, you close to Nibbana. This is good news. We don't even know what Nibbana is. We don't even know how to get there, how far we can get there, how much effort that we have to do. But the Buddha said, if you develop these four things, you are close to Nibbana. Virtuous behavior, this point to Sila, right? Or Patimokha for the monks. There are many rules for us to observe. And then you got the sendor, you need to know what it means. You need to know how to eat correctly and properly. Something more than that. You need to eat with the mind free from greed, free from anger. Sometimes you get the food you don't like. Why you eat, you get angry. Why I don't get you know, pizza today? Why you give me sticky rice? You keep complaining because you have no choice. You need to, especially if you're a foreigner, you're ordained in Thailand, you walk down to the village, they don't have pizza serve you. You get sticky rice, you get vegetable, you get local food, whatever they eat, they give you. And when you come back to the temple, you eat that food and you keep mentally complaining I don't like it, I don't like it, I don't like it. That's not the way we practice moderation in eating. Okay, there's some layer into it. So think about it. And then cannot be lazy. A bhikkhu who possesses these, their four qualities, is incapable of decline and is in the vicinity of Nibbana. That means you get close to Nibbana every day. 
as you walk down the path every single day. Okay, and here what Long Pi was mentioned earlier, these are the full training for someone to realize Nibbana. But what we learn today, only here. And there must be a reason why, there must be a reason why the Buddha mentioned only these three things to this particular group of audience that he teach. And in some teaching, this also in Maha Asapura Sutta, the Buddha teach the monk and he go in full detail about how the monk should be trained. You see Sila and Samadhi, uh, Sila, Samadhi and Panya also here in these 10 items, 10 factors. But what we learn today, the Apanaka Dhamma or the sure practice that will help us to realize Dibbana or to be happy also mentioned here. But you know, it's, this is a complete picture where they come from. Okay, and Dibbana are here. Today, I will not explain all of this, but I just to show you, just want to show you that there are something else involved in order for us to be happy. And if you are, are aiming at realize Dibbana, this is, this is the way to go okay. in step by step. Start from Hiri Otapa. This is what we learn, right? We learn Hiri Otapa, but we don't even know they exist here. Shame of doing bad and fear of the consequence of the bad thing that you are about to do, Hiri Otapa. We learn from the first week. Sati and Sampachanya are here. You see mindfulness and awareness. Sati and Sampachanya are also here in the state number seven. But you don't know how they connected, how they related to each other. So this is just um, the picture that Lumpi wants to share with you so you can go back and uh, catch up and go in detail. Check out this sutra if you like. Okay, In Machimanikaya number 39. And these are four sutras that I recommend. You don't have to, but if you feel like you want to, uh, you have time, go for it. Okay, the Apana, uh, Apabara Sutta, the Pachaya Sutta, Anatalakana Sutta. This talk about the non-self, the second teaching of the Buddha to those five monks, and the Mahasapura Sutta, the one that's this one, that go in the full detail of how the monk should be trained. What it's mean by the real monk, the real bhikkhu, through the lens of the Buddha. Okay. So we learned some new vocabulary today. We learned what anicca means, the impermanent. Impermanent also means rising and falling, moment to moment. And we learned dukkha. Okay, dukkha is not like suffering, general suffering. It's being oppressed. It's applied to both living being and non-living being. And we learned the concept of anatta, which today I like. It's just, the, I think, more like eye-opening. We haven't touched on the core idea of anatta yet. It's another big topic, but just... In this level, let's keep anatta simple, as simple as possible. That's anatta point to something that you cannot control, uncontrollable. Okay, so with that, I'm done for today. Hope everyone speak up something that uh, sounds interesting to you and uh, hope this open up your eye to uh, some other area of the Dhamma or the teaching of the Buddha that you can go deeper by yourself later on. Okay. Uh, if anything, just drop me the message, uh, the question, and I will find a way to answer to you guys. Yeah, wish everyone safe wherever you are. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy. See everyone again next Sunday.